Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. We're in Norfolk, the home of Lotus. In fact, this lovely place is the home of Team Lotus, the Formula One racing team. Now, the theme of this week's programme is all about uh, engineering and sporting innovation, represented in its day in good measure indeed by this delightful old Lotus in land. Delightful or not, you couldn't actually make and sell this car these days because it wouldn't meet so many of today's safety regulations. In fact, try and do the same thing today, and it turns out looking like this, the Mazda MX-5. Similar layout, but uh, longer, wider and higher than the old Elan, weighs fully 40% more for the same power. I drove this car in California last year for Top Gear. It will undoubtedly sell like hot cakes. But in attacking the same market, Lotus were concerned not so much to revive an old car, was to design a completely new one, which is why their new Elan looks so completely different. Chris Goffey has been putting it to the test. Ever since the original Elan ceased production in 1974, Lotus executives have been talking about its return. Plans originally conceived were for a rear-wheel drive car powered by a Toyota engine, since Toyota then had a quarter share in the company. However, when GM took control in 1986, the Elan project was revised yet again to its current form, with front-wheel drive, a first for the company. The decision was taken with some trepidation, since the Lotus name was synonymous with the ultimate in balance and handling, and that's something that's difficult to achieve with power going through the front wheels. However, in their inimitable way, Lotus seemed to have achieved just that in this design. But the world has moved on from the fragile and often unreliable Lotus sports cars of the past. Can this new design deliver the standards of quality and durability we've come to demand? Driving an open-top car in this weather demands certain precautions. Under the bonnet of the new Elan is uh, an Isuzu engine. Now, that's not a familiar name to many people in this country, but Isuzu is a, a General Motors subsidiary in Japan. And, of course, when General Motors acquired Lotus, they didn't want the original Toyota engine that was planned for this car. Lotus has done a lot of work with Isuzu on it. It's a 16-valve, twin-overhead cam, turbocharged unit. And thanks to the, the Lotus work, it now produces 165 brake horsepower. Now, the old Elan always had pop-up headlamps that were very distinctive, and the new Elan is no exception. But uh, let me show you how they work. Instead of a simple swivel, there's a double action. It seems to make rather a lot of noise, but Lotus say that the production versions should be better. Sports cars aren't usually noted for their luggage carrying capacity but at least the new Elan does have a boot although it's a very narrow aperture it's quite deep it's more suited to squashy bags than suitcases underneath the boot floor a, a space saver tire and of course in the older land there was always some space behind the rear seats for stowing things in this car that space has gone why because the space is utilized for the very neat hood arrangement just lift the flap the whole hood comes out, drop it, and the rear of the hood hinges down automatically and seals there. And the whole thing's in place with just two catches on the screen rail. Once in place, the hood doesn't flap, vibrate, or balloon at speed. It keeps the car warm and snug, and it also means that when cruising at 70, it's quiet. Something that's essential if you choose to test in Norfolk in February is weatherproofing, and the Lotus didn't leak on the move. This car did let water into a footwell overnight, though. Production cars won't, they say. The steering is very, very good on this car. It's a power steering system, but you wouldn't know it when you're on the move. It feels quite heavy, and that means you can place the car very accurately. You don't steer it round bends, you, you almost lean it round. But at parking speeds, despite all the weight on the front wheels and the front wheel drive, it's very easy to manoeuvre. With its sloping nose and low seats, it's difficult to judge the length for tight parking, but visibility is good even with the hood up. Brakes felt rather dead and the pedal travel too long. Lotus have now changed the servo, but inexplicably there's still no ABS offered. 
Even on wet roads, the grip's excellent. No excessive wheel spin and beautifully poised for swift, safe progress. Driving position's good and the seats give excellent support, but I didn't like the red lettering on the instruments. It's well equipped though, good stereo, power windows and mirrors. One thing that does irritate me, I find this uh, console too high and I, I hit my elbow on it and that means I can't quite get into second gear as easily as I would like. Um, the gear lever is in exactly the right place for fast changes, it's just this is too high for me. The Elan feels solid and well built. There are no shakes or rattles and it's eminently practical, a delight to drive. Lotus claim to have defeated the problems of front wheel drive with their patented front suspension. So to test ultimate performance, we return to their test track. At speed, the Elan proved to hang on well without excessive understeer. And despite the noise from those special Michelin tyres, the grip was exceptional. Although there's some body roll, it's entirely controllable, right up to the limit. And does it go? 0 to 60 in 5.7 seconds and on to a maximum of 137 miles an hour. And that's a function of the slippery shape. With the hood in place, the drag factor is 0.34, and that's good for a convertible with big fat tyres. The new Lotus Elan has been 14 years in gestation, but the wait's been worth it because the result, in my opinion, is absolutely superb. If you want a new car, you'll have to wait until the middle of next year for delivery because they've already pre-sold 4,000 of them. But I think it's the best fun on four wheels I've had for a very long time. So, overall, the Lotus Elan scores highly on its handling and performance. It's very well built and surprisingly refined. Against it, really only details. Poor instrument clarity and that intrusive armrest. You can't see the clock in its position behind the steering wheel, and I thought the door catch is rather fiddly for those who value their fingernails. But with that level of demand, it's another Lotus classic. Well, with that sort of demand, the new Elan will clearly be highly sought after for a long time. But it will also, no doubt, attract a great deal of attention from the wrong kind of driver. I mean, the joyrider. Now, security, of course, has always been a major problem with open-top cars. But these days, fully 25% of all recorded crime involves vehicles. And it seems that no manufacturer is really taking security serious enough. Lotus here in Norfolk is not just a car manufacturer. They put up a name for technical excellence, so they do a lot of design consultancy for other companies. As you would expect, that expertise is built into their own products. This engine, for example, that goes into the current Esprit has a very high power output for a relatively small unit, and yet manages to meet all the current emission control regulations, largely through the help of this three-way catalytic converter. Compulsory, of course, in the States, this is one of the few cars to carry a converter in this country as well. The converter will eliminate most of the air pollution and the acid rain caused by carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides, but it doesn't help with the other main pollutant, carbon dioxide, and that's a major greenhouse gas contributing towards global warming. In fact, by abandoning lead in fuels and using a catalytic converter, we accept a fuel consumption penalty that can be as great as 15%. So, by helping the local difficulties of smog and acid rain, we make worse a global problem of heating up the planet. So what can be done about it? Well, during this spring series, we want to look at various possible ways of improving the situation. There are, of course, political and social strategies. We're going to concentrate on the technological ones. Can the engineers provide a complete technical fix? Or will the best they can do mean only a partial reduction in carbon dioxide pollution, like, for example, using petrol more efficiently or turning to more economical fuels like diesel? 